Hey, morning. So, uh, last lecture, and we get to hear the origin of language here from Terence Deacon. So, uh, just to, to review quickly from last time, um, so these questions, why does Deacon believe that symbolic processing does not take place in a specific part of the brain? Uh, it's because symbolic processing requires linkages between different symbol to symbol relationships and so it requires interaction between uh, different parts of the brain and so really uh, symbolic processing requires um, that, the, that the entire brain be involved in different ways so it's, it's about relationships, about connections between different parts of the brain. What are three reasons that Deakin provides for why a relatively small number of genetic changes could have resulted in the human language ability? He talks about the way in which um, the the key aspect of brain size is the relationship of different parts of the brain to each other and those relationships are controlled by a comparatively few number of genes. He also talks about how much of the information that is used to structure the brain is not programmed um, in, in the genes but rather develops so to, on the fly, so to speak, in the process of brain development um, in, in which many neurons are created that then uh, die off when they're not used so that uh, that kind of design information is not necessary and so uh, you don't need that many that much genetic information to, 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 to control that process and finally he talks about the way in which the key aspect of language use is a general symbolic processing ability and that does not need to be pre-programmed um, uh, in a in, in, in a very specific detailed way. How does Deaker, Deacon interpret Broca's and Wernicke's uh, aphasia differently from Pinker and in a way that avoids the idea of a language module? He, uh, in contrast to Pinker who sees those uh, Broca's and Wernicke's areas as sort of language processing uh, modules or specific places in the brain where, where language is processed, Deacon interprets those areas as being basically um, switching points in the brain, sort of uh, network points where uh, the brain needs to sort of subtle information back and forth and those are sort of connecting points in the brain for that, uh, the, for, for, for the information that's transferred. How does Deacon interpret Williams syndrome differently from Pinker and, and in a way that avoids the idea of a language module? He interprets it uh, as a particular uh, impairment of the links between sign-sign relationships and sign-to-object relationships and then within the brain it's, it's, a, it's a problem of the linkage between that prefrontal cortex and the, the sensory motor areas uh, so that there's a problem with the indexical relationships um, that those particular patients are, are not able to construct so well even though they're able to uh, do very well in, in constructing sign to sign relationships. So um, now I'm going to move on from there um, to what we didn't cover last time. Let me see with the display here, the lights. So uh, <coughs> Deacon talks about uh, the way in which the phrase structure of language is adapted to the structure of the brain. And he, he underlines the way in which the brain, in order to function most efficiently, needs to break up um, short time span events from long time span events in order that they can be processed in separate parts of the brain simultaneously. So there, you know, there are many short term events that need to be processed when you're speaking. So things like how to construct a particular word, uh, how to understand a particular phrase. There are also these longer time frame events uh, which are really understanding the whole sentence, how, how the whole sentence fits into a, a larger group of sentences, for instance. So these, all of these different processing needs are actually having to go on simultaneously in the brain. And the phrase structure helps the brain um, to section off different pieces of what it's doing and sort of shuttle them to different parts of the brain for this kind of parallel processing. And so, uh, so th this tree structure of language then makes it easier for the brain to process uh, because it, it makes it easier for the brain to, to, uh, to split up 
the processing needs into different parts of the brain that can, par uh, that can process them in parallel. And so the phrase structure is doing that by kind of breaking things up and giving you signals, oh, this is a, this is a particular phrase, this is a section, that should be processed uh, as a whole. And that can be done sort of one, in one part of the brain while the sort of individual word processing can be done in a different part. Um, so, you know, again, this, is, this goes back to Deacon's warrant um, that language has evolved to fit the brain rather than the other way around, right? So this is an aspect of language with phrase structure, and he's saying that this is something that is a language evolved in order to fit the brain's processing needs. So overall, Deacon is sort of trying, he's linking up the needs of symbolic processing with different parts of the brain. And <coughs> symbolic processing requires, for instance, um, establishing this indexical connection between words and objects. So that's one, one of the bases of, uh, of, of what the brain needs to do. And he indicates these indexical associations between words and associated objects are, tend mostly to be constructed through uh, what he calls these cross-modality relationships that, that is like sound, like matching up a sound to something you see, matching up something you see to something you touch, right? Those types of relationships in the brain, of these different parts of the brain that, that process sound and vision, when they link together, those tend to be the ones that process these indexical relationships. He also indicates the way in which in, uh, in constructing a sentence, there are also these indexical relationships that are uh, marked by grammatical function words, um, you know, words like which and that, um, that mark off pieces of a sentence that s tell you, oh, this is, this is, this is going to be a new phrase, right? And he, s he sees those as a kind of um, indexional function within language um, that the brain encounters and is able to then uh, shift some of the processing to a different par part of the brain. Finally, he talks about iconic processing, which is, 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 is processing likenesses, uh, processing things that you recognize. Um, there's two aspects of that, that that he talks about. One is basically seeing one thing and, see, and, and recognizing it to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, an example of a particular class of objects, you know, saying, you know, this is, this is a man like other men. That's a kind of iconic relationship. And, and he just sees that as being processed within this sensory uh, or motor cortex, which in which you you're, you're recognize similarities between, between objects or recognizing that one object is belongs to a, to a larger class of objects, that's a likeness. So that's one aspect of that in the brain. And the other aspect that he talks about is uh, the way in which the brain needs in symbolic processing to be able to recognize a likeness, a similarity between relationships between signs and relationships between objects, right? And so that sort of that that the, the two levels and linking those two levels in a kind of metaphoric relationship, saying that these relationships between signs are, kind of, uh, <coughs> are recognized as like those relationships between objects. And this has to occur in a kind of um, higher level of processing, so to speak. And he talks about the way in which the, the two brain hemispheres, the left brain and right brain, are important for doing this because the left brain tends to do the fast processing of um, functions that need to be done quickly, such as uh, being able to construct a word, being able to integrate sounds into a particular word, and then it leaves the right brain to do some of the, the sort of long-term processing, uh, such as um, keeping track of the, the, the phrases in an entire sentence, keeping track of how uh, several sentences fit together, s keeping track of how maybe an entire essay fits together into a whole, right? So. Um, that, that's, th that split then between left and right brain is also helping then to construct these higher order recognition uh, processes that are also in fact iconic but are on iconic on a, a kind of a different level in which you're, you're, you're linking up sign-sign uh, relationships to object relationships.